All right, here we go. This is our first lecture. It is, when is it? It's the fall of 2020. It is Tuesday. It's our first cardiovascular and pulmonary pathology lecture. We'll be focusing on basically problems with the pipes, vascular conditions, this whole first half of the class, of the quarter. And yep, so here we go. <clears throat> so this class, I built this pretty much from scratch, basically entirely from scratch. So the board, chiropractic board examiner books that are the law are Rubens and Robbins. Actually, a brand new Robbins and Cotran just came out for 2020. Uh, just like a brand new Guyton's just came out for 2020. So I haven't gotten a chance to dig into those too much yet. Uh, a new Bates came out. That's how I built this lab. Uh, remember the the boards, the chiropractic boards don't use Jarvis. So I don't know why people still use Jarvis here. Uh, I use Bates and I use Seidel. Those are the two board books. Uh, Bates just came out with a new, and I do have that one, and I have incorporated that one into our lectures. It hasn't really changed much. Um, and here's some of the other less important, I mean, I, I read all these books to, to make this class, but you don't, and you know my slides, just like same story for GIGU. My, I give you my teaching slides, so you really don't need to get any of these books, I don't think. And we'll talk about the, the EKG books when we get uh, to the heart. All right, so we're, this is about disease of the circulatory system, so let's actually talk a little bit about the circulatory system. So we all know what that is, right? That's all the big pipes and little pipes that go to every nook and cranny of your body has pipes uh, that transport blood, which is filled with oxygen, and because all of your cells in your body from the tip of your little toe to the tip of your nose to a brain cell, a heart cell, liver cell, pancreas cell, you name it, it needs oxygen. How do we get it oxygen? Through the circulatory system. We also use the circulatory system to deliver hormones as well, and we use the circulatory system to remove the waste that cells make, mainly CO2, but other nitrogenous wastes are also made. Uh, immunosurveillance is another function of the circulatory system. A bug gets in your finger into the blood into the blood system or into the circulatory system and it ramps up the immune system sees it and ramps up a response against it. There's two divisions of the circulatory system. Cardiovascular system, which we're mainly going to focus on. We'll look a little bit at the lymphatic system <clears throat> as well. So we'll start talking about cardiovascular system. There's actually four kind of subsystems within the cardiovascular system. There's an easy one. There's a pulmonary loop or pulmonary system or pulmonary, pulmonary division of the cardiovascular system. And that simply includes the right heart and the vessels that lead to the lungs and the vessels that lead back to the left side of the heart. That's the pulmonary loop. We'll see a picture of it in a second. Then there's the much larger loop, and that's called the systemic loop. And that's everything else except for the lungs. That goes all the way up to your head, down to your toes. It includes the left side of the heart as well, the powerful left side. That's why the left side of the heart is so big, uh, right? Because it has to contract much harder. Uh, to force blood through this giant systemic system. And the right heart is pretty wimpy because all it has to do is send blood to the lungs and back. So it's got a very easy job. There's some other systems that the heart itself is up the pump that supplies the force needed to push blood through the cardiovascular system. We have kind of, it's not really like a heart, but we have another system in the lower extremities, mainly in the soleus muscle. Soleus muscle is filled with a honeycomb of venous blood vessels. And every time you walk, or if you're standing, swaying back and forth, anytime you're 
contracting your soleus muscle, you're actually squeezing blood up out of the lower extremities. And that's a very important system. That's called the calf muscle pump. And then the other system is the lungs themselves, which I actually have a YouTube video. I think I've been trying to cut some of these, like this lecture, this is the first lecture, so I'm going to, I'll do the anatomy and physiology, but I'm trying to cut all that out so I can get more pathology. This class I have 4,000 slides for, and I never, I get like through half of them. There's so many, there's so many diseases and things that we don't get to, so I'm trying to get rid of this stuff, but. Uh, and make you watch it. I won't test you on it if I do that though, but this stuff is fair game for testing. So here's these loops. So here's the right heart, of course, uh, and all it has to do is pump blood um, to the lungs and then it returns blood to the left atria. That's it. Pretty easy job. Look at that compared to the uh, the left heart in the systemic loop. It's just right massive all the way up to the heads upper limbs down everything so that's why the left side of the heart is so much bigger and more powerful just another little little drawing pretty self-explanatory all right now let's talk about the beaver you are I'm going to over and over and over again I'm going to use this analogy not of this beaver this was actually back in the day I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember this or reruns but leave it to beaver was always a very popular show back in I think it was back in the 60s I remember when I was a little kid uh, he's a very mischievous little guy always getting in trouble this is a little mischievous guy as well because he can he likes to build dams and he likes to dam up rivers and it can cause destruction because of the backup that occurs upstream from the dam so let's talk about the beaver dam today I thought you'd never I bet you never would have thought you'd talk about a little biology here a little a little biology zoology I guess it would be but like a so like a river a blood vessel has a flow to it right just like a river uh, the the flow of blood goes downstream or most likely in the boards they wouldn't say downstream they'll say distal the flow of blood is distal to some reference point that's a super important concept uh, the from that same reference point you have water flowing toward the reference point that would be proximal to that reference point uh, or you could say upstream uh, to that reference point right let's look at some pictures here okay so here is a this looks like a lot of fun I went to school in a place called Big Rapids Michigan and this was our favorite pastime on the weekends is floating down the river so I have a lot of experience with this uh, but if we use uh, this the kayaker is going over a tiny little miniature rapids here but let's use this as the reference point so if we talk about anything down here this is downstream or distal anything upstream here would be proximal or upstream in response in respect to this reference point you have to have a reference point when you talk about upstream and downstream okay no beaver dam here uh, and so the river is about the same width. Now, if we enter a beaver dam into the uh, into the story here, this was once a little more like a stream, not a river. Uh, but here, our little mischievous beaver has built a dam, and you can see what's happened. The downstream to the beaver dam, which we can say is the reference point. Uh, look at the flow. There's hardly any flow. There's just a trickle of water coming out here. And then look at the flow. Look at the situation upstream to the reference point, to the beaver dam. Look at it's massive, right? The water has backed up. It's, it's invaded the banks of the river here. It's gotten up to these trees. And so, and this is the story with the beaver dam. And like atherosclerotic plaque, let's say. This is a huge piece of uh, atherosclerotic plaque that's kind of beaver dam to blood vessel and the same thing happens upstream it stretches out the blood vessel puts pressure on the walls and you get a big 
backup of blood. But downstream from the atherosclerotic plaque, you get a little trickle of blood. Maybe initially, I'm getting ahead of my slides here too. Um, so here's the atherosclerotic plaque set up. Uh, so here's the river coming down, and we have a backup of blood. You can see all the blood plate or blood vessels, the red blood cells, kind of piling up here, and it's increasing pressure on the walls here. And then to get through here, it, it's almost like putting your finger over a hose, right? We've all done that. Uh, the water comes spraying out at high velocity. However, what's the volume of that water downstream? There's the volume has decreased, so you might get a spray coming out which could actually balloon out a blood vessel if it hits it just right. But the bottom line is the flow is decreased because of the beaver dam. So we have decreased flow, we have a backup of blood, increased pressure, decreased pressure here. What does the heart have to do to overcome this? Because this tissue down here, um, let's say this is a foot down here, uh, the foot down here it demands, the cells demand oxygen, and the body will sense that, and so the heart's going to have to pump harder to get through the beaver dam to make the foot happy. Uh, but that's the problem with atherosclerosis. The heart can compensate by pumping harder, but it can't do that for years and years and years and years. After a decade or two, the heart's going to start to to get big and ugly and start to fail and in two or three decades it'll start to fail you have heart failure from setup like this all right three main types of blood vessels or systems really there's an arterial system we'll look at capillary system we've looked at that a little bit in GIGU I think and a, a venous system so the I think I go through this but just in case I don't there's a large artery system like the ascending aorta, the aortic arch, descending aorta, abdominal aorta, thoracic aorta, medium sized vessels like the renal arteries, small arteries, then the arterioles. This is part of the microcirculation. Capillaries are part of the microcirculation. We learned about the different types. We'll look at those again. Uh, then we have venules or venules, tomatoes, tomatoes. These guys right here. That's part of the microcirculation. I talk about that all the time. When I say microcirculation, that's what I'm talking about. These three, these three uh, types of blood vessels, and then the veins get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they finally become the vena cava. All right. So arteries, a little physiology, not too crazy though. Uh, so they're under high pressure, right? Um, even though they're under high pressure, even the, the big pipes are quite elastic, especially in your younger people. And they give when you have a big blast of blood coming out of the heart. Uh, they actually expand in size to dissipate some of that energy. Uh, and that's a very important thing, that expansion, as we'll see. Uh, because in the ascend aorta and the aortic arch expand with a blast of systolic blood coming out. And then during diastole, you get a contraction of that expanded uh, aorta. And that contraction, or that kind of recoil, if you will, of the aorta, it propels blood downstream. Uh, that's why our, we have a continuous flow of blood. If you ever cut yourself, the blood doesn't, uh, it can spurt a little bit, but it doesn't stop. It doesn't some drip out and stop and drip out and stop it's continuous flow and it's because of that elastic property uh, is why we get that but even perhaps more importantly is that elastic property not only pushes blood downstream but the elastic recoil of the ascending aorta pushes blood backwards toward the heart toward the ventricles and we have little parachute valves Right? The semilunar valves will pop open as it senses blood moving retrograde, or moving backwards. And so that's super important for a, fu a normally functioning heart. Uh, that elasticity is. Uh, that, and that's, that's how the semilunar valves close, right? They don't, it's, they're not electric. They, don't, they, they pressure close, and it's that recoil that pressure closes those. 
and we'll see what happens when that gets messed up later on. The arterioles, again, part of the microcirculation. Uh, really important, pound for pound, these guys have more smooth muscle than any other blood vessel in the body. Uh, we know that we can control that smooth muscle in the center by different mechanisms and angiotensin 2 and uh, norepinephrine and there's different ways we can contract it but when you contract it it closes the the pipe size right it closes the lumen of the artery and therefore you can regulate how much blood is getting into the capillaries to feed the tissue associated with those capillaries so they're very important arterioles or uh, venules ha also have probably second pound for pound have more tunica media than any other vessel and those also are important in blood pressure control but arterioles are even more important because they're upstream from the venules or venules all right i think i got that capillaries we've talked about those the three types again continuous fenestrated and discontinuous all uh, different increasing degrees of leakiness not so leaky here pretty stingy medium leakiness remember in GIGU we talked about fenestrated capillaries are in the glomerulus and they're in the pituitary and then we have the super leaky discontinuous type of capillaries they also act as a barrier uh, they keep red blood cells and white cells normally inside the blood but they let all other stuff go out into the interstitium uh, like nitrogen and glucose and oxygen and carbon dioxide comes back in so they do have a barrier function here they are here's that same picture continuous so they don't have pores in them fenestrated have pores in them uh, this is probably the most common type here and then discontinuous are like a leaky sieve uh, bone marrow in the spleen and the continuous found in fat muscle in the nervous system much stingier the ones I talk about all the time are these fenestrated because they're in the GI system and the endocrine system and such they service the interstitium and its cells yep that's true because that's where the, the oxygen has to jump out of the red blood cell go through the capillary wall and get into the interstitium and swim over to the cell and be engulfed by the cell and utilized by the cell uh, so they they service the interstitium they service tissue they service cells all over the body they're surrounded by a lymph capillary here's a question lymph capillary is it blind ended or is it continuous like like arterial and uh, capillaries are we know those are double-ended right they have a they're connected to the arterial and a venule what about lymph capillaries yeah they're blind-ended right a little weird that's where they start there's no there's only one end to those things so that's called blind-ended now they can be turned off completely there's met arterials and AV bypasses we'll talk about later you probably remember from histology or physiology the interstitium is a very important concept it's 99 percent uh, of the blood I call it blood water because it's really water that makes the interstitium which is driven out of the blood it's the exact same the contents of the interstitium are ex almost exactly the same as the blood except the platelets the white blood cells all the big red blood cells all the big things the proteins the albumin things like that can't get through uh, but otherwise the interstitium is the, just blood fluid uh, so 99 percent of the blood water is actually held within oh no there's that word right I think I talked I think we went over that in where did we go over that in spinal anatomy did was I doing that I know I've recently I've put that in but I think you I got you guys with it as well about proteoglycans remember they're like little sponges and 99% of your interstitium is actually the water that makes up the interstitium is actually held inside of these proteoglycans so the interstitium is not normally 
water. It's a proteoglycan gel, like the nucleus propulsus, very similar to that. 1% of, normally I should say, 1% of the interstitium has these clumps because water is uh, it's polar, right? It, it likes to hang out together. So you have these free clumps that are scattered throughout the interstitium. Uh, and these are called riv, like rivet, u lets, rivulets. Could be a guyton, that's a board book, so I don't know if you know that word, but I would know that word. Uh, and when we talk about swelling, that can go up to 50% of the interstitium is filled with that. Swelling is very, very squishy and very movable. Nevertheless, you would think because it's a proteoglycan gel, maybe it's hard for oxygen to diffuse through it, or maybe it's hard for glucose to diffuse through it. It actually isn't. It's about 98% as fast as going through pure water, uh, the, div the diffusion uh, through the interstitium. Right, there's what we've been talking about. There's a cartoon of a capillary. This is not a meta arterial. This is just a run-of-the-mill capillary here. But the point of this is to show you the lymph microcirculation here. The lymph capillary is right here. And notice that they're dead-ended. They dead-end into, uh, into capillaries. And if we, we blow this area up, the excess interstitial fluid, because you have a positive flow of interstitial fluid, some of it is returned in the distal capillary, but not all of it. Um, the rest of it is actually sucked into the lymph system here. And you can see it, the little black arrows are showing this kind of blood water ending up here. So in order to have a non-swollen tissue, you have to have a normal functioning capillary and you have to have a normal functioning lymph vessel. If you do, you're not going to be all puffy. But what happens if you get a beaver dam? Here's our friend the beaver just came here. Now what's going to happen? Well, let's see. The flow is this way. So, yeah, you're going to get a backup here. You're not going to be able to drain off the interstitium in this region. And you're going to get puffy. You're going to swell. Right? So we could... Any, any screwed up mechanism. What if the lymph vessel is okay? Uh, but what if, what if you get, uh, let's say, histamine, too much histamine released, and these capillaries, the pores in these capillaries, these endothelial cells, they open way up and let too much water flood into the interstitium. Well, then you can't drain it off. If you get too much water, blood water being released into the interstitium, you're gonna another way you can swell. And we'll talk about all those. That's just a little hint there. So they have fairly low pressure, so blood moves relatively slow through them to give time for oxygen exchange, carbon dioxide, nutrients to be dumped off. There's an important hydrostatic pressure gradient that is super important for driving blood fluid out of the proximal capillary, including oxygen, including glucose and nitrogen and all the stuff your cells need to live. It's driven out of the proximal capillary and, and it's returned uh, via oncotic pressure in the distal capillary. And I know I think Dr. Doe has talked about some new research on this, but be very careful. This is still taught exactly how I'm going to tell you here. It's still taught uh, in Guyton. It comes from Guyton, just as exactly what I'm saying here. So th that stuff, and I do that too. Not that that's a bad thing, uh, because I, we want to teach you the latest theory on this stuff. But remember, for board purposes, this is the way it's going to show up on boards. Okay. Um, oncotic pressure. Guyton actually does. I was actually reading it last night to. Uh, just to see the words that they use. The, the Guyton uses colloid osmotic pressure. And in fact, he doesn't even give an AKA of oncotic pressure, which is the way I learned it in physiology. And other physiology books use oncotic pressure. So uh, you'll probably see it on boards. The colloid osmotic pressure is an AKA for oncotic pressure. All right, and here's the classic, uh, the classic diagram that you should all probably learn back in junior high, I bet. But you have blood coming in here. It has a higher pressure gradient. It's about 30 millimeters of mercury. Um, so that uh, that hydrostatic pressure uh, will drive 
fluid out. There's an oxygen molecule. There's a nitrogen molecule. It drives it out here. Uh, that's a pushing force. As you go through the capillary, you lose the pushing force. Uh, the hydrostatic pressure decreases. Notice the little arrows are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You have a constant. You can think of it as a sucking force uh, trying to um, trying to suck fluid back in to the capillary and it's pretty constant. This uh, it's an osmotic gradient that is created here uh, because of the large blood proteins like albumin is by far the king. So you have these giant albumin particles going through here. So this this oncotic force or this osmotic colloid osmotic force sucking force is always about the same. right? So right here, it has no chance of overpowering the pushing force, the hydrostatic force. So nutrients, blood fluid are pushed out in the proximal capillary. But by the time you get to the distal capillary, this, this hydrostatic pressure has petered out. And now the on oncotic pressure or the colloid osmotic pressure rules the day. So you have more sucking force. So now your, your CO2 and your extra blood fluid is sucked back in here to the distal capillary. And remember it's more complicated because there's there's other forces. There's four forces, right? There's hydrostatic pressure inside the blood vessels, but the interstitium, right? This is all interstitium. Um, that has its own hydrostatic pressure, but it's it's minuscule. It doesn't compare at all to this. So therefore the force is always pushing out here. And the same deal, the interstitium also has a oncotic pressure as well, but it's minuscule compared to that of the capillary. So to learn it, it's better to not even think that they exist. And I know you probably had to calculate pressures and things like that. All right, so you should pretty much understand that. All right, so now we're through the capillary. The first thing the, the blood runs into now is a venule. Sometimes they're called post-capillary venules. Uh, it is a, the third member of the microcirculation. Remember who's the microcirculation? Arterial capillary venule is the microcirculation. Uh, a lot of veins have valves, but these don't have valves. So it's valveless, and it's going to pass the blood to bigger veins, which do start to have veins or valves, especially... Uh, if you're talking about your lower extremities. They also have muscular walls, uh, fairly muscular, pound for pound. They're probably the second most meaty wall there is. Um, so therefore, they can help with blood pressure control. All right. Um, there's a post-capillary venule right there. Uh, veins in general, they're very stretchy, right? Uh, what's that? And here's a here's a here's a, the ultimate beaver dam, right? This is the human beavers built this thing, and you can see water jetting out here, and it looks like oh my god, there must be so much more water, but the volume of water here compared to here is nothing, even though it's coming flying out. Um, but the blood, the the veins are very stretchy in general, and we don't say stretchy. The physiology word is compliance. They have high compliance. And because they have high compliance and are stretchy, they also have the capacity to, capacity to do this, to hold more blood. And therefore, the high compliance causes them to have a high capacitance as well. Capacitance is the reservoir function, the stretchy, the ability to hold blood. Uh, more blood is, is held right now in your venous system compared to your arterial system. Uh, has valves we've talked about already has enough tunica media still to contract. Uh, now, not as much pound for pound. It's not as much as the venules, but it still has a tunica media. And Frank Starling's law can, uh, can, can be used in this case. Uh, because, oh, it's because of this tunica media that Frank Starling's law on the right side of the heart exists. Uh, if a tiger jumps out of the woods and sympathetics fire, you will get a contraction of the tunica media of the of the veins uh, and that injects blood into the heart and stretches the right heart out and then we know from frank starling's law that if the if the 
heart wall is stretched, it contracts fiercely, much more strongly uh, than normal. And that kind of that gives you a jump start uh, to it gives the muscles a charge of blood to start getting away from the tiger. The veins in and of themselves are not very good at controlling blood pressure. They they don't have the ability to close down very much though. And then under progressively lower and lower pressure as they move toward the heart. Here's a two-sided heart. Uh, that's one of the systems, right? The right side and the left side. I'll say that. I'll talk constantly. When I say the right heart, of course, I'm talking about the right atrium, right ventricle. And when I say the left heart, I'm talking about the left atria and left ventricle. The left heart, therefore, drives the systemic loop. The right heart, therefore, drives the pulmonary loop of the cardiovascular system. Now, if you don't know this, I'm, I'm worried. I think some of you have learned it, like crash learned it and then forgot it. Uh, but you hopefully you know this. You need to know this. I assume you know this. This is going to be like your ABCs, right? If you don't know this thing, you, you put it on a note card. Make sure you know this because I'm going to assume you know this. We'll go through it one time, though. Uh, so the flow of blood comes in through the vena cava. There's the superior vena cava. There's the inferior vena cava. It gets dumped into the right atria. Here's the question. Is there a valve here? Is there a valve down here? No, there's no valve. That's why you ever look at your jugular vein. Sometimes you can see it pulsing. That pulse is actually coming from your right, uh, from atrial systole. That's why you can see that. And the reason you can see that is because there is no valve here. Now there is a the Bijan valve. There is kind of a, it's not really a full valve, but there's, we'll look at that when we get to the heart, but there is kind of a makeshift. Well, I don't want to really call it a valve. It's more like a guide. Uh, there's a fin uh, they call it a valve, but there's a fin that guides the blood uh, toward the duct to the patent foraminal volley when you're in your mommy's uh, belly. And that still persists. And it goes into the tendon of Tordaro. Remember that stuff? But we'll talk about that when the time comes. Anyway, so blood goes from the right atria. And there's a coronary sinus, right? There's the osteum for the coronary sinus down there, uh, which dumps the venous blood of the heart. Everything comes, starts, the story starts in the right atria. So what's this first valve called? Try before you buy. Tricuspid, right? Blood goes through the tricuspid valve uh, into the right ventricle. Uh, blood turns the quarter, goes over a little infundibulum. There's a little part of the heart called the infundibulum. It's like a little speed bump. It takes up speed. It shoots up through the pulmonary trunk here, through these valves. Do not call these the right semilunar valves. You never say that in clinical pathology. These are always called the pulmonary valves or the pulmonic valves. The only time you ever use the word semilunar is when you're talking about both of these together. So semilunar would be collectively speaking. All right, so blood goes up here. Is this oxygenated or deoxygenated blood? Deoxygenated. All right, then it splits. We'll talk about this split. Saddle embolisms occur at this split. What, is, what are these pipes called? Well, they must be veins, right? Because they have deoxygenated blood. No, don't be silly. Um, they're called arteries. Pipes that move that carry the blood away from the heart are always called arteries. It's not, they don't care whether or not they have oxygen or not. So those are the pulmonary arteries. And then they go to the lungs. They come back. Notice two pipes go out. Four come back. So there's four pulmonary veins. The oxygenated or oxygenated blood? Oxygenated blood. That blood dumps into the left atria. And it goes through the... Don't call it. Don't ever call it the bicuspid valve. Nobody ever calls it the bicuspid valve. That's only in anatomy. It's always called the mitral valve mitral valve goes through the two cuspid mitral valve into the powerful left ventricle shot out through the 
Good. Da, don't call it the left semilunar valve. Never, never. Well, it's the aortic valve. Right? Aortic valve. Super important. Having a bad aortic valve is, some say, as bad as having cancer. Uh, almost always leads to aortic valve replacement, which is going to put you on uh, immunosuppressants, and it's just some people are born with a bicuspid aortic valve, uh, which usually doesn't last. Can, I mean, there's always an exception, but usually wears out 30, 40 years old. Got to get it replaced. All right, so that's the story. There's, uh, oh, the Beaverdam concept. So I assume you know this. This is super important. This is kind of the star of the show, the Beaver Dam here. So I'm going to talk all the time about a beaver dam which occurs in various places. One of my favorite places for a beaver dam to occur is the left side of the heart. Uh, so we can have a beaver dam here. What if you have mitral valve stenosis and these valves only open this much during systole, during atrial systole? Um, so that's a beaver dam, right? You got all this blood coming in here and it can't get out because atrial systole occurs and these don't open and so that's the beaver dam same thing with the aortic valves uh, that's even more common they get stiff and when ventricular systole occurs you can't get all the blood out of the ventricle yet you have all this new blood coming in so that's going to send a backup of blood backwards through the circulatory system and that's the the concept of a beaver dam a person with with a beaver dam in the left heart here, let's say aortic stenosis, um, they can eventually have problems all the way down to their ankles. This backup can go so far, you can get swelling in your ankles from this. On the way, you're going to get swelling in a lot of other places, right? The lungs are going to get filled up with fluid. The right ventricle is going to stretch out. You're going to get a bulgy jugular vein because of the backup. Uh, you're gonna, your liver's going to swell up with blood. Your spleen is going to swell up with blood. You might start leaking uh, fluid into the, inter into the peritoneal cavity, peritoneal cavity, tomatoes, tomatoes, uh, and eventually can get all the way down to the feet. And so that's the important concept of the beaver dam, and that's everything I said right here. Uh, so that stretchy uh, jugular vein, is called Kuzmol sign. We'll talk about that more specifically. Stretched out, blown up liver, hepatomegaly. Stretched up, blown out spleen, splenomegaly. Um, right ventricular enlargement from a beaver dam and left heart. What's the number one cause of right heart failure? Left heart failure. How can that possibly be? Beaver dam phenomenon. Blood backs up through the lungs. The right heart is overloaded. Starling's effect is always on, and you wreck the right side of your heart. Um, no, that's not correct. I hear someone's brain saying, that's core pulmonale, right? No, that is not core pulmonale. Um, core pulmonale, it's true core pulmonale is right heart failure. But core pulmonale, has, the cause of it has to be a problem with the lungs, a beaver dam in the lungs not a beaver dam in the heart. We'll cover that when the time comes, though. Um, so you get fluid in your belly cavity, in your peritoneal cavity, that's called ascites. And then you get fluid around the ankles, that's called a dependent edema. And we'll expand on that term. Now, this is why I don't draw, but I've attempted to draw something. And this is my right, this is my setup here left heart, right heart, lungs, which should be connected together. Or no, they don't have to be connected. There should be double pipes coming out of each of these. That would make my diagram too messy, though. All right. Normally, the flow of blood, we know the flow of blood, right? It goes through the lungs like this, comes into the left ventricle, etc. Uh, remember that this venous blood comes backwards this way, out of the lower extremities, through the peritoneal cavity, through the vena cava, really, you know, it's tributaries. Kind of a double flow here, right? You got the, the portal system here as well. 
but now you get a beaver dam, as everything I just said. You get a beaver dam in the left heart, and everything backs up. Everything runs reverse, and that's what I just talked about, how the blood is backing up. Kuzmol sign, hepatomegaly. Uh, remember, the hepatic portal connects a venous system to the spleen, so you get splenomegaly. Uh, then you get you get blood fluid dripping in and overfilling the peritoneal cavity, so you get ascites, and then your feet start to swell. You get dependent edema. So out of this whole lecture, this is probably the most important concept. This is, I would say, well, we're going to talk about other stuff too. But Everybody good with that? It's pretty, pretty intuitive. Now let me throw this, this at you. We can have a physiological, uh, we, have, we can have a mechanical beaver dam if the valves don't work, but we can also have a kind of physiological beaver dam, right? What if you have left, what if you just have heart failure? You have cardiomyopathy, which is a fancy, what is cardiomyopathy? That's just a fancy kind of a basket category that means your heart's not working. There's many different types or causes of cardiomyopathy, but it means your heart is shot and it can't pump blood out like it's supposed to. Could that be a beaver dam? Absolutely. Now that's a beaver dam because you can't if you can't get the all the blood coming into the heart, if you can't get it out of the heart, you're going to have a backup of blood. So the heart itself is a beaver dam. That's a physiological beaver dam. All right, here's a patient who has uh, a beaver dam. He has mitral valve stenosis, uh, severe, and he's come into the clinic. He's not feeling good. And yeah, there's what his jug is. You ever seen that? You, hopefully you've never seen that. That's not normal. Uh, and Kuzmol sign. We'll learn about Kuzmol sign. Take a deep breath in. Uh, everybody's got little prominent jugular veins, right? If you lay down, you can see them. If you take a deep breath in, it should disappear or at least not get worse. If he takes a deep breath in, they actually bug out. They get worse and bigger. That's Kuzmol sign. We'll talk about that when the time comes. Blood vessel wall. Basic histology here. Remember, there's a tunica intima, median adventitia. I assume you know this and haven't just memorized it for the test and then forgot it. You need to learn this like your ABCs, because I'm going to talk about it like your ABCs. You're going to be lost if you don't. You know, when I'm saying the tunic adventitia, if you have to think and say, oh, God, what is that tunic adventitia? Where's my multiple choice list? You're going to be lost with these lectures. So make sure you know these three layers, the intima, the media, the adventitia, the outer layer. And there's the capillary system we just talked about. Let's meet the tunics. And so tunica intima is the innermost layer. It's intimate with the blood. That's where that came from. I'm not sure if that's where it came from, but that works for me. Tunica media, M for middle. Tunica adventitia, uh, adventures happen in the outside. So adventures are to the outside. Tunica adventitia. Watch out for these AKAs because some of the board books use different terminology. Uh, tunica interna. They're not going to use that because that gives it away, but uh, they could. Uh, and tu tunica externa, or just the externa, that's AKA for tunica adventitia. There it is, histological picture of it. You can see the cigar-shaped nuclei I tell you you're in the meaty muscular tunica media. You can see the nuclei of the endothelial layer here of the tunica intima. Tunica media, tunica adventitia is this layer out here. Tunica intima, let's talk more deeply about it. It's the inner layer of capillary artery or vein. They all have tunica media. Even your heart has kind of a tunica media. It's in direct contact with the blood. In arteries, it has two different layers, right? That's always a good, easy question. It's got a internal and external elastic laminae. All right, gives it. Why would the artery need two extra layers? Veins don't have those two layers. They look like Swiss cheese. Who's got higher pressure? Arteries have way higher pressure, so the committee designed them with two extra layers. Underneath, the, so what are the exact layers? Uh, there's an endothelial layer. 
So remember when I say endothelial layer, I'm really talking about a bunch of cells, right? A bunch of these flat cells. So what are they? They're simple squamous. So the endothelial layer is made of simple squamous epithelial cells. So really the endothelial layer is just an epithelial layer of simple squamous. They call it the endothelial layer because it has a lot of magical properties compared to many simple squamous like your skin, which is stratified. Um, of course has contact with the blood. Super biologically active. You will not like this layer if you probably already studied this layer. And it's a lot of stuff. Those cells are very busy. They make a lot of stuff. We need to talk about that stuff. And some of that stuff is uh, where SARS-CoV-2 binds, right? We talked about uh, we talked about that in GIGU already about ACE2 receptors, which are on epithelial cells on the cell membrane of. <clears throat> Underneath the endothelial layer, <clears throat> did I bring my water? Yep, let me take a time out and I can't stop this recording, so you're going to have to listen to me drink some water. Okay, underneath the endothelial layer you have a basal lamina. <clears throat> which is just connective tissue. It just gives, gives the endothelial cells something to sit on. Not very exciting. Even less exciting underneath that, there's a subendothelial layer. And if you're an artery, you have an internal elastic laminae. They're still not 100% sure why it has these holes in it. Uh, but probably the best function, arguably, is it gives a little extra strength to the arteries. Remember veins don't have those. Really nice picture. You can see all the layers. You can see the Swiss cheese. I can immediately tell this is an artery because there's an internal elastic laminate. There's the external elastic laminate. And actually it makes it easy to tell where you are because anything kind of superficial to this or anything t toward the lumen would be in the tunica, ad or tunica intima anything kind of deep to it depending which way is deep and which way is uh, which way is superficial uh, but anything kind of toward the outside world that's the tunica media and then the external elastic laminate separates the tunica media from the adventitia and then we have a now yeah, we'll get to those all right so you can actually see all the layers there's the cells these are the simple squamous epithelial cells which make up the endothelium. They sit on a basal lamina in light blue. Underneath the basal lamina there's a subendothelial layer and there is the the internal elastic laminae. Swiss cheese. Deeper, deeper we go. <clears throat> They're found in arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins. Uh, they're found in the lymph system as well. Uh, oh, little embryology. We've got to do some embryology, right? Where do they come from? Endothelium. Blood vessels. We know they come. it comes from mesoderm. right? Remember, mesoderm is converted into hemangioblasts. Hemangioblasts give rise to blood vessels. These types of blood vessels. Um, they are, there's an endothelium uh, layer that's, that lines the heart as well. Same deal, simple squamous. Uh, they don't call it endothelium though, we'll call those that layer the endocardium, but it's exactly the same. Histologically speaking, again, it's a single layer of cells. They're flat, elongated, simple squamous. There's just a histological drawing. What's this region called here? That's the interstitium, right? Is that the interstitium? Yeah, that is the interstitium. All right, the adjacent cells connect together and bend to create a lumen. So if you're a capillary, you may have 
there's a nucleus the entire cell amazing drawing ability the entire cell may wrap to form one cell may make the lumen in fact it happens in small capillaries in little like venules you might have a dozen or so cells contributing to the lumen <clears throat> but they they do bend to make the lumen Is anything there nope uh, that luminal surface has a bunch of receptors that are important uh, for hooking up with molecules like insulin receptors, super important, histamine receptors. LDL receptors are really important when pathology. That's we got to talk about those. Um, that's an LDL receptor right there. So you should memorize this entire structure. No, I'm just kidding. I don't think you'd have to go that deep unless you're uh, would you? I don't know. Molecular biologist maybe. But you should know that's a that's a LDL receptor. Uh you should know it extends. There's the cell membrane of a endothelial cell. Maybe it's endothelial cell of a blood vessel in your calf. Uh there's the cytosol, there's the interstitium out there. Um actually that's not the interstitium. Right, this is blood. We got blood going through there. 53. Got to remember that. I like cards, 52 cards. So I'll remember that. 52 cards in a deck of cards. I can remember that. Get rid of that interstitium. But that's just the blood. This thing is waving and flapping in the blood. And what does the LDL receptor do? Well, <laughs> duh. It grabs LDLs. It snags them. Uh, and then it real through endocytosis it pulls them inside the cell uh, where they can be broken down and we can use like the cholesterol and stuff lipid inside of it we can use all that for our cell maintenance so what happens if you have LDL receptor mutations which are fairly common in humans well you can't grab LDLs Right? You'll have more LDLs floating around your blood than your neighbor who has normal LDL receptors. So what? So what if they're floating around? Well, that's that's your cholesterol and LDL levels go hand in hand. Um, that's bad. Uh, that's the spark that causes atherosclerosis. If you have high LDLs floating around, you have hypercholesterolemia, you have hyperlipoproteinemia, what do you mean LDLs? I thought low density li these are lipoproteins. Well, how can they be involved with cholesterol? Anybody know that? You biochemists out there? You guys had biochemistry, you should know that. What's an LDL made of? Well, it's got a core of it's made of of cholesterol, right? Part of the co the core of the thing is filled with cholesterol, a different type of cholesterol. Um but it carries cholesterol inside. It's a cholesterol carrying case filled with cholesterol as well as triacylglycerides or fat is carried in here. Uh, so this is not thing. This thing, if it's floating around and bumping around in your blood, it'll crack open and release all this stuff. Uh, and then e even worse than that, these LDLs, they love to sneak between epithelial cells especially epithelial cells that are damaged. There's two epithelial cells. And these guys can sneak right in between. And that is the start of atherosclerosis. That's the lumen right here. That is the start of, uh, of atherosclerosis, right? If LDLs sneak in between epithelial cells and get underneath the epithelial cells, you've just started a wicked inflammation. I don't know why I drew that. I could have just went to this picture. So there's all the uh, the cholesterol. It's unesterified cholesterol that makes up the LDL itself. There's phospholipids. It's not a phospholipid bilayer, though. It's a phospholipid monolayer that creates an LDL. And then we have cholesterol esters. The real cholesterol is just kind of hanging out in here where there's a triacylglyceride, a.k.a. triglyceride. 
And then there's the apple protein, apple B protein. You remember all that from biochemistry, I'm sure, so I won't go into that. Um, so if your receptors are broken, they can't pull the LDL. And then the LDLs float around, and they can be extremely mischievous, especially if you have hypertension. People with hypertension tend to have beat up endothelium, and it's easier for these LDLs to sneak in and spark the process of atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis sometimes doesn't cause much trouble, but sometimes the inflammation can be so bad that this, uh, this is crazy. Every time I say this, smooth muscle cells can actually become phagocytic and they can wall off. They can kind of line up in here. Because, right, the tunica media, they come all the way from the tunica media. Uh, so they come out of here, and not only do they eat the LDLs, they wall it off. And when they wall it off, you start to get a huge bump here. And that is a atherosclerotic plaque, and that is trouble. What else do they do? Well, they secrete all kinds of stuff, different types of collagens, laminin, or lamin, prostacyclin, PGI2, um, some blood clotting stuff, factors, thrombo, prothrombogenic factors, endothelin, nitric oxide. We're going to talk about all these. Our cute little von Willebrand factor, which is another COVID story we'll talk about on Thursday. Um, so, and then of course, it's super important, right? ACE, we've already talked about ACE. Endothelial cells have an enzyme called ACE, and that's the key player in the R2A system that we talked about because we know ACE converts angiotensin 1 into the sometimes evil angiotensin 2. Can be the hero, can be the zero. Depends how much of it is there around, or there's around. We talked about that, and we also know that ACE2 is another enzyme that sits on endothelial cells, uh, specifically, well, they're, they're everywhere in the body, they're in the heart. Everywhere COVID's striking, ACE2, ACE2 enzymes live. So in the lungs, tons of them in the lungs, especially in the alveoli, right? We said, what, type, what cells do they live in, in the alveoli? Type 2 pneumocytes what do they do type 2 pneumocytes secrete surfactant well that's also the gateway for SARS-CoV-2 to enter to cause COVID-19 so uh, ACE2 is also really important so we need it functioning so it creates kind of the uh, kind of the keeper of angiotensin 2 angiotensin 1-7 uh, we said that has exactly the opposite effects of angiotensin 2, and it'll keep angiotensin 2 from getting too out of control. It kind of angiotensin 1 7 kind of puts a cage around our little Tasmanian devil there. Barrier function. Yeah, there is some barrier function, right? It makes red blood cells can't get out. You think of the capillary when you think of think of this, but also bugs, it makes bugs harder to get into the blood vessel and invade tissue. It has tight junctions between them. How do molecules, what if you want to get across? Uh, simple diffusion in capillaries. There's an active transport system. We just talked about receptor-mediated endocytosis. Uh, and there's holes in some of them, like fenestrated capillaries. Fenestrations can be there. So there's ways to get through it if you need to. Um, there, another important concept, it, it, they release something called PAM, and PAM makes the lumen very slippery. No, that's not true, is it? But we do use PAM on our frying pans when we're cooking our omelet pans, so things don't stick. And they do secrete the slippery three. So endothelial cells are very important. Um, and you want them to secrete a little bit of PAM all the time because you don't want platelets sticking and you don't want you don't want clots to develop in your blood vessels. We don't really call them clots, even though everybody does. It's really thrombosis. You don't want the process of thrombosis to start. It's easier to say you don't want a clot to start, even though it's not perfectly correct. 
but yeah arterial clots are no joke because they can lead to a piece of that thrombosis can break loose now you got a bomb floating through your arterial blood vessels and if that happened in your left atria which does often with people with atrial fib that little bomb that little broken piece of clot can go up into your noodle cause a stroke it could kill you um, yep the slippery three so there are three anticoagulant biomolecules that are released we should look at um, always remember the toilet paper I just put that in there I was thinking of that this morning uh, the toilet paper to remember them uh, th the th thrombomodulin next one T for tissue plasminogen activator or TPA and then prostacyclin is for the paper you gotta know these three if you don't already you should definitely know the slippery three endothelial cell injury yeah we kinda of said already the endothelial cells they can't get beat up they got especially the arteries right they they're under high pressure and uh, that can start to develop cracks between them it can break the uh, cell adhesion molecules break the tight junctions down if you're under high stress all the time and um, turbulent blood flow from hypertension can injure that as well but what if you have an aneurysm and you have crazy blood flow going through an aneurysm really fast blood flow, uh, blood flow that can cause it a tumor outside causing a pushing in of the vessel causes abnormal blood flow atherosclerosis causes abnormal blood flow downstream uh, and upstream too much pressure from the beaver dam kind of the backup so these could all cause endothelial cell injuries uh, how about a vessel wall injury how about a myocardial infarction definitely can injure uh, blood vessels blood vessels need their cells they need fluid they need they need oxygen too. If you have a myocardial infarction, you get an area of dead tissue um, that definitely can injure it. You can get inflammation of the endothelial cells, a vasculitis, or an infection which causes a vasculitis, a catheter injury, chronic inflammation, kind of a vasculitis again, but different type, an autoimmune related inflammation of the endothelial cells. We'll talk about Berger's disease uh, where and some people burgers almost only seen in smokers they, they get a chronic inflammation we're not exactly sure why uh, but it it can kind of beaver dam up the blood vessels from chronic inflammation and you usually happens in your legs and you lose your toes and feet uh, if you don't get that treated uh, environmental pollution can do the same thing uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that more when the time comes bacteria endotoxins radiation therapy metabolic abnormalities homocysteinemia is one uh, hypocholesterolemia that should be hypercholesterolemia 68 how can we remember 68 I can remember it I won't tell you how I can remember it but I can remember that I think we can all maybe remember that number See how you memorize stuff, right? You have to hook it to things. You hook it to memories that you already have, especially when you get old like me. It's hard to make new memories, but if I can hook hook new things to old things, then I can remember stuff. Who cares about endothelial cell injuries? Uh, someone who had a stroke might care about it. Uh, it can lead to some really deadly stuff, like the dreaded arterial thrombus formation. Uh, which can lead to stroke, myocardial infarction, hypotension, uh, tissue ischemia. We can talk a lot about this when the time comes. A deep vein thrombosis usually can can it cause a stroke? So if you get a DVT, let's say you get a blood clot in your femoral vein. Even worse, how about in your common femoral vein? And it breaks loose. Can you get a stroke from that? normally in a normal person with a normal heart nope can't do it right where's the end of that follow the path follow the river you know get in your tube you guys been tubing any of you you, you guys still do tubing nowadays we should do that all the time get in your inner tube and float so get in your inner tube 
and trace the course of the deep femoral vein, or where did we say it was? The superficial femoral vein. Oh, you should never call it superficial femoral vein. Anyway, so it goes back. It ends up in the lungs, right? You get stuck in the microcirculation in the lungs, assuming you don't have a patent ductus arteriosus or a patent foramen ovale. We'll talk about that. Um, yeah, so the endothelial cell injury, if this, too much inflammation occurs, you could have weakness of the endothelial cells. They can break and rip, and uh, you, you might get a leak. Response to injury theory. I think we'll talk about that more when the time comes. But um, So if the endothelial cells are being aggravated, when cells are aggravated, they do what cells that are aggravated are going to do. They're either going to stop working or they're going to overdo something. And endothelial cells that are upset, they can overproduce some substances and underproduce some other substances. So they may overproduce some of these clotting factors, von Willebrand factor and plasminogen activator inhibitor. Or they may underproduce the slippery three, like tissue plasminogen activator. So that's kind of a double whammy with plasminogen activator, right? Uh, because you, the Turner offer uh, is, or inhibitor is, no, let me think about that for a minute. If it's overproduced tissue plasminogen inhibitor, yeah, yeah, I guess that would still work. But anyway, the slippery three here, uh, thrombomodulin, uh, TPA, prostacycline. Those are you have to have the slippery three, right? Or platelets are going to stick, and you're going to get a clot. All right, and both of these conditions can lead to thrombus. Okay, so that's enough for your brains today. I will talk to y'all. I don't know when I'll talk to y'all. Talk to y'all soon. See you a lot this quarter. See you later.